Right, I'm with Nicholas Shaxton, somewhere in Jersey on a sunny day. You're here to uh, discuss, promote your book, which is called what? Treasure Islands, uh, Tax Havens and the Men Who Stole the World. And it's travelling around the world, it's doing very well? Yeah, it's doing, it's having great success. It's, uh, been, uh, it's got 14 publishers around the world, including the e-book, and uh, there's a new uh, uh, smaller paperback coming out in January, which is basically the same book. Uh, there are various different languages coming out over the next uh, few months, and it's, uh, yeah, it's doing very well. I take it it's not altogether flattering of tax havens? No, it's not. It's um, uh, the book, really, the subtitle, Tax Havens and the Men Who Stole the World, it really kind of encapsulates it. I mean, it, it, it's an attempt to show people that tax havens are not just... Uh, the popular perception has always been of tax havens as these kind of small, wacky, exotic, out-of-the-way places where you get a few mafiosi and criminals and drug smugglers, perhaps, but, but otherwise a sort of marginal oddity on the fringes of the world economy. This book is something that uh, really lays out how tax havens have, particularly since the beginning of the era of globalization, since uh, the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, have grown much, much faster than the onshore economies and have kind of, the offshore system has pushed its way onshore as well and it's become, it is now right at the front and centre of the global economy, tax haven, the offshore system is, is right at the centre of everything that happens. Today, worldwide, there are demonstrations taking place in many capital cities, no lesser cities, that's related to the subject matter I take it of your book. Absolutely. Um, this is a story about a system that is not it's not really controlled by anybody, but it's, uh, it's a sort of impersonal force in the global economy that is ultimately responsible for what I, s I believe is the, the, it is the greatest single reason for uh, inequality in the world today. Uh, it is for many, many reasons. Um, it is a great, you know, there's a great shifting of wealth upwards from the poorer sections of society up to the richer sections and particularly to the, you know, the top 1%. The, the super rich and the offshore system is right at the heart of this this mechanism and uh, uh, yeah all the problems we're seeing in the world today they all have many causes offshore is never the only cause of, of these problems it, but it is always uh, if you look at any of the problems that happen in developing countries in rich countries uh, deficits all of these things uh, offshore is right at right behind these stories fundamental ingredients of, uh, of the problems one of the common themes of the demonstrations which are taking place today is that people are frustrated that their governments are not reacting. They're having to demonstrate because the governments are not responding. Absolutely. Uh, one of the big questions that I set out to answer in the, in the book was why has this system been tolerated um, and why have governments, governments not been trying to crack down on, on this stuff? And uh, it's a question I've been asked again and again. You know, why, ha why do people tolerate this stuff? Why do people allow the wealthiest elites in their countries to escape offshore and do what they're not allowed to do at home to escape taxes or financial regulation or criminal laws or whatever it is um, and the book kind of lays out uh, that you know ultimately this is an issue uh, talking about the offshore system this is an issue that really is about where political and economic power is wielded in the world today this is about uh, who really runs uh, countries and, and, and you know what's behind what's behind the decisions, and uh, I, you know I think this reveals a system that the, the UK has an enormous role in the whole global offshore system. Um, as people of Jersey know very well, you know the Crown dependencies are a big part of the part of the UK's offshore networks. You know partly partly British, partly outside of Britain. The overseas territories, the Cayman Islands and so on, are, are sort of an, an outer ring of that. And there are a whole load of other tax havens around the world that have long and deep historical roots to Britain and the city of London. I mean, Hong Kong is a great example. Um, uh, you know, banks like HSBC are deeply rooted in there and there's this sort of conduit between China and the rest of the world. But basically, there's this huge sort of network of tax havens, partly British tax havens, thrown across the globe. And all of these tax havens are around the place in the Caribbean. They're hoovering up business from Latin America, from North America. In, in, in the crown case of the Crown Dependencies, they're hoovering up business not just from the UK but from Europe and, and further afield. And, and these are all channeling huge amounts of money and, and the business of handling money, which is a very important... Not thing. exactly a secret yeah. activity or hidden away from sight, is it? Nobody's hiding well, the activity. Everybody knows it's there. 
I think everyone in Jersey knows it's there. I think in the UK and in other countries, people have not really been aware of it because they have had this perception that it's a small marginal thing. They've kind of known that something is going on, but this is not something we need to worry about. Uh, in, uh, I actually wrote a previous book about oil and politics in Africa, and, um, uh, I, and, and as I was writing the conclusion of that, I was just kind of waking up to the, to the, the offshore system. And... I was trying to. I asked myself, how do you know? How do I explain this lack of visibility of this gigantic system at the middle of the global economy? And uh, I described it in terms of uh, Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There's a there's a uh, thing called an SEP field, a somebody else's problem field, that allowed a, a spaceship to land in the middle of a busy busy cricket game without anybody noticing. And um, Really, th I think this is this is kind of what uh, what has been behind the problem. People haven't noticed. And I think that is now just starting to change. I think people are just starting to notice that there's something really big going on here. Strong words have been expressed. So Obama famously, when he focused on the building in the Cayman, which had all these thousands of companies registered, their focused attention. But did that result in any action? Obama made made a very strong statement about that, and he co-sponsored some legislation, the Stop Tax Haven Abuse Act, that really started. You know, it was a serious attempt to to go with this stuff. He's gone very quiet since co coming into power. He um, he hasn't been a, a particular supporter of the offshore system, but neither has he been a supporter of those such as Senator Carl Levin, who are trying to lead legislation to uh, to crack down on it. And uh, the legislation hasn't really gone anywhere, and, and now Obama is kind of on the defensive. That you know, there are all sorts of lobbyists lobbying for fantastic new tax breaks. There's a great thing about repatriating offshore profits in, through an amnesty, and you know, Obama is kind of on the back foot. But I, I think he's, you know, you see so many politicians before they come into power, they say we're going to do something about the offshore system. Gordon Brown said it. We're going to do something about it, and. Uh, you know, and Tony Blair did nothing, Brown did nothing. It was, there was just, you know, what I call the great acquiescence, the great sort of, let's let the city do its stuff. We'll take the tax revenue and let's uh, just. Uh, well, Winston Churchill was talking about it in the twenties. Dennis Healy was talking about squeezing the fruit till the pips come out or something. I mean, till the pips squeak, yeah. pips squeak, and all that. Yes, I mean, so it's yeah. it is a an often voiced refrain, yeah. what did you say? Nothing it is, I mean, so, you know, it is a very nice soundbite for politicians to say we're going to crack down the offshore system, but when they get into power, the, 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 the energy seems to go out of those promises. Um, and uh, in, in Britain's case, it's very much that, you know, the City of London, of course, has enormous, enormous power. And the City of London is being fed by this international network of tax havens. It is one of the great reasons why the city is so powerful and so difficult to reform because... One of the uh, puzzles to me is that you get uh, politicians, as we've seen, we expect politicians to be corrupt, but uh, professional people, lots of decent people go into the professions, law, accountancy. What happens to them? Where does their voice go? Because they must, they're obviously intimately involved. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a question I've always asked myself. Why has there been so little so few people in these professions to have stood up and uh, said we don't we don't like this and it is incredibly incredible how small the number you know a, a lot of people you know I have friends who are bankers and you know they're lovely people and charming people and you know you you meet lots of people who are in these professions and I have relatives in you know in these professions and they just you know at the end of the day one of the great answers is that people are scared of losing their, you know, their, their jobs and they're worried about their families, you know, going to but school But they have professional whatever. ethical codes, these bodies, don't they? But they, 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 the other day somebody was asking the question here, somebody, I forget who it was, about the Nigerian money which seems, keeps recurring here, Abacha's money, you know, his cohorts and so on. The, the little guys, relatively little guys, get prosecuted, but the lawyers, the bankers, and all the accountants who facilitate, they never finish up in court, do they? I think part of the issue is that uh, a lot of the offshore structures are cast, you know, a structure will not just be located in one jurisdiction. You will have a trust uh, in one jurisdiction with the trustees in another jurisdiction, and that trust will own a, an international business company in the Caribbean, and that company will have a bank account in Switzerland. And no, at the lower levels, the people who are dealing with these particular structures, you can never see what's actually happening with this structure. You can never know who is ultimately behind it. Um, the trustees will, will generally know uh, what, what is really going on. But generally, the people, uh, it is the people in the higher levels who will actually 
know what's going on. That's quite a small number of people. But the sort of lower level apparatchiks in these in these uh, companies that are that are you know providing uh, you know company servers and things like that, they just won't know what's going on because they'll just see names of companies, anonymous companies. They don't know who who the, who behind it. They just doing carrying out the mechanics that's and that's one part of it but I think um, another part of it is that is that there's just a there's just a, a whole ideology that has built up in the offshore system it's a remarkable uh, you know you find it in you know the same ideas you know you come to Jersey and you speak to people in the finance industry you go to the Cayman Islands you speak to people in the finance industry that there and you get the same uh, incredibly sort of libertarian, anti-tax, um, anti-regulation ideology that is incredibly pervasive. I remember there was one um, uh, a guy in the in the Cayman Islands, former chairman of the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, who said who who was talking about the Tax Justice Network and saying these people are crazy, they're they're idiots, and uh, every single person I speak to agrees with me. And it's like there's a kind of bubble. These people all talk to each other and they all agree with each other. Uh, and there's there's so little interest in uh, dealing with what's really going on in the real real world and listening to the opinions of people in the world, real world. And that's partly because what they're doing uh, is agreeing among themselves about business with no accountability to the people elsewhere who are being affected.